Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, members of the public who are viewing uh, our meeting live stream this evening, or if you're uh, viewing the uh, recorded webcast uh, from our website uh, after the meeting. And um, I'd like to call a regular council meeting for Monday, November 9th, uh, to order at 6 p.m. And um, I'm uh, Mayor Cliff McNeil Smith, and joining me here in the council chamber are Councillors uh, Chad Rintoul and Scott Garnett. And our four colleagues are joining us via Zoom this evening. Uh, you can hear their audio. You won't be able to see their video. And uh, good evening to uh, councillors uh, uh, Barbara Fallett, uh, Sarah Duncan, Terry O'Keefe, and Peter Wainwright. Uh, also joining us in the council chamber this evening are several staff. Uh, we have CEO Randy Humble, uh, Director of Corporate Services Andrew Hissick, Director of Engineering Works and Parks um, Jen Clary. Uh, Senior Manager of uh, Current Planning, Alison Verhagen, uh, IT Manager, Will Maxwell, and our um, Executive Assistant, Paula Cully. Uh, I'd like to begin with uh, a respectful acknowledgement that we're holding this evening's meeting in the territory of the Wasinich Nation. And um, as we look to approval for the agenda, we have a number of items to add. Uh, we have uh, uh, late correspondence from uh, uh, both from received from CRD and a reply to CRD and we'll add that under correspondence as item 14b and we have 12 items of correspondence uh, from members of the public with regards to the uh, pickleball uh, proposal and uh, we'll add those uh, to the single item we already have under item 4c1 so with those additions if I could have a motion on the agenda please uh, I would just like to say that in honor of the iconic Alex Trebek, what is I move the approval of the amended agenda? Second. All those in favor? Uh, motion carries. Thank you. We'll now move to uh, public participation, and uh, we do have two written submissions uh, received this evening. We have no one uh, to speak um, uh, to us in person. Uh, and I'll turn to Mr. Humble to read those uh, those uh, letters of uh, submission. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, both of these uh, submissions deal with the um, uh, tree preservation bylaw. The first one is from Ms. Linda Comer, and Ms. Comer has requested that uh, she has a series of questions. She requests that her uh, questions be read out along with uh, the um, the subsequent response from uh, from town staff. So. Um, the way I'll do this is I'll read the uh, Ms. Comer's questions and then I'll read the response from staff if that's, uh, if that's appropriate. So it reads as follows. Hello, I have gone through the proposed new and old bylaws and am pleased to see more trees added to the protected list, size changes and more control over tree removal and plantings. I have some questions. Number one, there are, there are a few very large and iconic cypress trees in Sydney that should be protected as well. Don't you agree? The response, due to their large size, many of Sydney's Monterey, Monterey Cypress trees would be designated as protected trees under the proposed amended bylaw as they meet or exceed the minimum 60 centimeter DBH requirement. Question number two, developers that are clearing the property of protected trees and others uh, can get off pretty easily by sticking a replacement tree or two at the edge of the property which doesn't return to the community an established, healthy, larger tree that was cut down. Can you further restrict them from removing trees that are not in the footprint of the buildings, such as driveways and sidewalks on the property? They can make concessions if required, reduce variances to increase size. Response, it is true that many trees get removed in order to accommodate new development with larger building footprints. Generally speaking, we do not permit developers to remove protected trees that are outside a building footprint unless the tree is in poor health or overly restricts a permitted use to be carried out on site. The location of protected trees on a property proposed to be developed com comes under staff review early on in the development review process. And there has been and will continue to be instances where we have asked a developer to redesign their proposal in order to preserve on and off-site protected trees. The public may not always be aware of this as it often occurs in the pre-application stage. Town staff have additionally supported development variance permits to allow alternate siting of a building in order to preserve protected trees 
as can be seen in the recent 10216 Rabinia Place and 2498 Beaufort Road DVPs. Question number three. Is there a restriction that can be placed on how much land, soil, earth is covered on a lot by developers' buildings? If not, there should be. Setbacks and green space should be mandated. Staff's response. Yes, our zoning bylaw restricts the lot coverage of buildings and requires minimum lot line setbacks for buildings on all properties in Sydney. Our off-street parking and loading bylaw restricts the amount of front yard area that can be covered by a driveway and our OCP has requirements for landscaping in development permit areas which function to increase green space. I agree that more green space is better and I'm looking forward to our OCP revision where we can take a closer look at our existing policies, objectives and design guidelines. Thank you, Ms. Comer, for, uh, for your submission. Mr. Mayor, the um, second piece of uh, public participation correspondence is from Valerie Howe and Bruce Sterling, and it reads as follows. I would like to congratulate you on the proposed changes to the tree bylaw. I think the proposals, if adopted, will make a significant improvement to the current process and to the sustainability of our town. I have a few questions and suggestions which I hope can be addressed at the meeting on November 2nd. Please forward these to the Mayor and Council if that is appropriate. Number one, my main concern is in regard to the proposed changes to Section 10. You propose that replacement trees for some species of trees of tree over 40 centimetres or for other species over 12 metres tall be increased to three trees. I support this improvement but feel that it should be strengthened. Currently trees of this size are becoming rare in Sydney and therefore extremely precious. One of the proposals which I believe the town was looking at was to hire or contract someone to map and catalogue these remaining large, large trees. Is there any progress on that front? How might that be accomplished? I believe that such trees should be removed only under the most dire of circumstances, not simply because the owner or developer wishes a larger house. We are at the point where the loss of any more of our few remaining giants would fundamentally alter the look and the sustainability of the town. If any of them are removed, surely the area allocated to the three replacement trees would need to be significantly greater than the drip line of the removed tree, else how could those replacement trees ever grow to the size of the one removed? And surely it would take much longer than two years to determine if the replacement trees had any hope of reaching the size of the original, and therefore the deposit would need to be held much longer. And who would determine which species comprises the replacement. You cannot replace a giant big leaf maple with a crab apple tree. Number two, could, should the yellow cedar be included in protective native trees? And do we know if there are any, any here now? Number three, what are the other recommendations related to trees and the urban forest which you recommend be dealt with in the official plan instead of in the tree bylaw? I understand the point and suspect that the issue Issues that I would raise in regard to soil quality for replacement trees and retaining green footprint and some native shrubs, pollinator species, etc., on all lots are among the remaining that you propose be dealt with elsewhere. I would just like to be confident that those issues not be lost. To be relatively green and attractive and to improve sustainability and adapt to climate change, it will be necessary to protect not only trees but also soil to remediate and improve soil quality, and to maintain bee, bird, and wildlife corridors, shrubs and hedgerows, and healthy shorelines and foreshores, for example. Importantly, we need a plan to prevent the practice where developers often remove topsoil and replace it with dead dirt or pave over soil. Once that has happened, nothing can grow, so replacement trees are pointless. Relatedly, I would suggest that the section on replacement trees be amended to ensure that the Number four, I note the reference to cost constraints and as a citizen urge the town to consider various ways to address these. We for two would support higher taxes if they were directed towards keeping the town green. Do you see a role as suggested in the urban forest strategy for tree keepers or tree ambassadors, whether individuals or organizations, to monitor the health and well-being of trees on a given street or neighborhood? 
Thank you, Valerie Howe and Bruce Sterling. And Mr. Mayor, the uh, correspondence was responded to by staff on um, November 3rd. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Humble. And um, thank you to Ms. Howe and uh, Mr. Sterling for, uh, for your detailed submission. We appreciate your comments. Uh, and thank you to staff for the reply. And I'm, I'm, I know council uh, may wish to discuss some of those points when that agenda item comes up later this evening. Uh, that, uh, that closes uh, public participation, uh, so we'll turn to item 4C, which is our presentation this evening from uh, Ms. Corrine Reed uh, from the Sandwich Peninsula Pickleball Association on a proposal to expand pickleball facilities in Iroquois Park. I'll turn to staff if, um, if uh, Ms. Reed has, uh, has joined our, and I do see her. Uh, can you hear me, Ms. Reed? You're just connecting, I see, your audio. Do you want to uh, to try again to unmute, uh, Ms. Reed? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. If, if you're able to increase vo your volume just a little. I'll just speak. How about now? Can you hear me better? That's excellent. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Reed, you do have uh, 10 minutes uh, for your um, for your presentation this evening. Uh, we'd ask you to stay close to that if, if you do have something to time yourself, but certainly uh, we'll be opening it up to, uh, to questions from Council after, uh, after your presentation. And then at the conclusion of, uh, of the Q&A, uh, Council will turn to it as, a, as an agenda item and deliberate this evening. Uh, you now have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to present our proposal for pickleball courts at Iroquois Park. As you've all received our presentation, I won't go over it word for word, but I'll summarize it. Uh, first of all, I'm Corrine Reed. I'm the president of the Saanich Peninsula Pickleball Association. And with me is Helen Brandon. Hello. <laughs> um, the Saanich Peninsula Pickleball Association, or SPPA, it was incorporated in 2017. We have 122 members, and the breakdown of the members per municipality is on page one, figure one. For those of you not familiar with pickleball, it is similar to tennis, but is played on a smaller badminton sized court. It uses a paddle and wiffle ball. A game is played to 11 points. The sport is low cost, has an easy underhand serve and a lower net height. This is what allows it to be accessible to all people, which is particularly relevant in Sydney where the median age is 58, sorry, 59.8 years. Pickleball is great exercise and has a short learning curve, which appeals to people of all ages. It offers a welcoming and social atmosphere and becomes increasingly challenging as the skill level increases. But most of all, pickleball is fun. Pickleball in Sydney would be a great addition to the recreational facilities available within Sydney. The majority of our members reside in and around Sydney and pickleball is a very social sport Participating and or watching others play provides a means of nurturing and maintaining social contacts and connections and to the Sydney community. Rarely do only four players come to a court to play. Often eight or more play at the same time. Therefore, the ideal venue has multiple courts. Sydney courts would allow residents to play locally and many could walk or ride their bikes to the courts. We recommend Iroquois Park be developed to include a pickleball venue. It, in combination with neighboring Talista Park, offer a wide variety of recreational opportunities. They include skateboarding, water play, basketball, volleyball, tennis, and soccer. In addition, the park is under the flight path of the Victoria International Airport and adjacent to a relatively busy road, which is Fifth Street. Transportation noise and sounds from other recreational activities in the park will mitigate sounds generated from pickleball play. There is also plenty of parking available and washrooms already in place that eliminates the need for these facilities to be constructed. A trial period in 2016 of seven months resulted in only positive feedback from the community as mentioned in our presentation. Our proposal is scenario one, repurposing of the existing two tennis courts at Iroquois Park to six pickleball courts. Locating six courts at Iroquois Park would give Sydney the premier outdoor facility on the Lower Island. And we've included that in figure three of what it would look like. 
It would be great for residents of Sydney as well as other pickleball enthusiasts from around the area. The benefit to local businesses would be substantial as pickleball is a very social game. Many groups head for coffee or a meal after playing, which brings revenue to local businesses. Also, as players are already out in Sydney, many will choose to shop and run other errands while in town. Victoria will be hosting the 55 plus BC Summer Games in September of 2021. The organizing committee will be looking for a local venue to host the pickleball competition. And if the proposed scenario one is implemented, Sydney with six new courts would be the natural choice. The games are anticipated to draw 3,600 athletes and 1,200 volunteers to Victoria and the surrounding area, which based on the 200 pickleball players attending the 2019 Kelowna Games would bring significant business and exposure to the town of Sydney. This would be great for Sydney as accommodation and food services will be required. In addition, the new facility would provide a venue for other tournaments, thereby generating additional revenue for the local economy. We have investigated the cost associated with this proposal of six courts, and we've attached the quote from Victoria Playco. The cost, sorry, the total cost of this scenario is 35,290 plus GST or approximately 6,000 per court. And on page five, we listed the pros and cons for this scenario. In scenario two, repurposing of the East tennis court at Iroquois Park to four pickleball courts. The second scenario we are presenting involves converting the, sorry, the East court is recommended because the court has two gates and a paved walkway running along the side of the court, thereby facilitating access to the proposed courts. SPPA has measured the existing courts and factored in recommendations concerning court dimensions from Pickleball Canada to derive a scenario where four pickleball courts are placed within a tennis court. While this scenario results in less surrounding space than ideal for four courts, it has the benefit of maintaining one of the tennis courts in the park. Based on the quote from Playco, we estimate the cost associated with this scenario would be approximately $30,000, or the cost per court would be roughly $7,500. The pros and cons of this scenario have been summarized in Table 2. The SPPA will be a able to assist with some of these costs. We are currently awaiting a reply for a local sport relief fund grant we applied for. If rewarded, it will provide up to $7,500. Other grants can be applied for once we have the municipality's approval, as this is necessary to go forward with these applications. Also, a cost-sharing agreement could be arranged with the town where the association pays an amount annually for the use of the courts. On behalf of our members and to the benefit of all pickleball players on the peninsula, our recommendation is scenario one be selected for the following reasons. It will result in six pickleball courts rather than four. The construction of the six courts is nominally more expensive than constructing just four courts. Third, sorry, the addition of six new pickleball courts will be forward thinking considering the ever increasing popularity of the sport. Six courts will facilitate both league play and tournaments. And a large number of courts will allow instruction to play, sorry, instruction and play concurrently. The courts will benefit both the SPPA members and other local residents of all ages and playing abilities. Our goal would be to have these courts opened in spring of 2021. The downside to scenario one is the removal of the two tennis courts from the park. However, there are numerous other tennis courts in the local vicinity of Iroquois Park. We realize the loss of this tennis court will affect the tennis community and we would be happy to work with the Peninsula Tennis Club, Council and our staff on how the needs of both sports can be met in Sydney in the short and medium term. Thank you again for the opportunity to present our proposal for pickleball courts in Sydney by the sea. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Uh, I'll turn to my colleagues and uh, I'll start with uh, Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Reed. Um, just out of curiosity, when you were doing your uh, research for various, the various two proposals, did you investigate what the cost would be to create six courts from scratch without having to go over a, a tennis courts that were already present? I don't have an exact amount figure, but um, the ones that were built in North Saanich were 130,000 
and that was a few years ago. So I would think uh, probably around 130 to 150,000. And if I may, Mr. Mayor, sorry, thank you. Uh, question through to staff, if you could. Is there uh, any space in Iroquois Park where courts could be built exclusively for pickleball? Is there room, I guess is the question. Um, through the mayor to Councillor Garnett, yeah, from a, from a staff perspective, I mean, we haven't done a detailed analysis, but I think space is pretty limited in Iroquois Park currently for any uh, additional uh, um, facilities. Are there, sorry, just to continue, are there any areas that you can think of where there might be space to in, accommodate such a thing? In Iroquois Park? Or in Sydney in general, if Iroquois is too tight? Um, yeah. Huh. Is, yeah, I believe Rathdown is identified in our Parks Master Plan for, uh, is it Brether? Brether, sorry. Brether Park is uh, identified for uh, pickleball courts, but... Uh, there might be some space as well in, in Rathdown. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor uh, Fallett. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Reed, for your presentation. Um, I was um, really quite impressed with your, your stats between the membership of the um, SPPA and the Peninsula Tennis Club. There uh, certainly appears to be a growing number of people playing pickleball. One of my concerns is the sound and uh, that's been talked about in uh, from previous commentators that pickleball is a fairly loud sport and that may be a deterrent for where a court can be placed. Do you have any comments on that? Yes. I, um, it, there is a particular sound that is emitted from playing pickleball, and that is why we thought that Iroquois would be the best part. The other, sorry, best park. The other two parks that were mentioned are more residential and feel that perhaps a tennis court would be better suited for those parks. Okay, so uh, just further to, um, to staff's comments regarding the other two parks, the difference there is neither of those two parks have got washroom facilities uh, so that may be um, a detriment for making that a location or it includes an extra cost so um, i'm very supportive of your sport and and um, finding a location to accommodate your needs i think the numbers speak to that um, and I also look at, you know, we've, we've got a number of tennis courts, but if we look at the numbers of players, there seems to be more pickleball players and you do need a place to play. So right now for me, the struggle is where do we, where do we place your courts? So that's my comments for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any questions? Uh, I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Kareen Reed, nice to see you. Um, I, I think your presentation was excellent. It was very thorough. I'm I'm very supportive of having more pickleball courts in in Sydney. All of the reasons you gave are good reasons. And um, like my colleagues, the only thing I struggle with is um, you know giving up tennis courts um, and taking that away from tennis players. And I think there was some reference to the number of people with your association versus a tennis association. But I think that there's a lot of people that don't, that play tennis that maybe aren't necessarily part of a formal association. And so would like to use our tennis court. So I think that's kind of one thing um, we need to keep in mind. Um, so I'm supportive. I'm just, uh, yeah, wondering about where we, where we would put it. Um, and I guess, you know, staff have mentioned a couple options at Brether Park at Rathdown. I'm concerned about that uh, because they're both in, in residential areas. Um, so I'd be interested to hear if, um, yeah, any, any other options that might be out there. I'm not sure what the answer is, but uh, I'd, I'd like to support it if we can. Uh, so thanks for your presentation. Thank you, Councillor. 
Uh, seeing no other questions, I have uh, I have one or two, Ms. Reed. Um, the first is um, we we did uh, you did approach myself and and we did have a meeting uh, some time ago about bringing this proposal forward to council and and um, could you speak for a moment about um, I mean one of the one of the things that it's of interest to me and I'm sure to my colleagues is that uh, what is what is the the tennis association there's a, a Peninsula Tennis Association Councilor O'Keefe has certainly accurately remarked that there would be uh, tennis players in Sydney. Uh, who are not members of that association, but have you, I know you've contacted the Tennis Association and, and um, had discussions with regards to their views on that becoming a pickleball facility. Um, yes, I did have a meeting with Alan, who's the president of the Tennis Saanich Peninsula Tennis Association, and um, we spoke at length about different options and um, they really want to work together with Pickleball and Sydney to get something that will work for both sports. It would be great if um, we could have that meeting and um, I am confident we could come up with something that would satisfy both sports. Thank you. Uh, my second question has to do with funding, uh, whichever option, if, if an option were to be supported by council. Um, and that is, uh, there are examples uh, in, other, in other sports or other community facilities where an association will, uh, will agree to pay a certain portion of the, um, of, the, of the capital cost. And let's, if we take, for example, the uh, a cost, estimated cost of 35000 has the, um, for six courts, has the Pickleball Association given consideration to making a commitment to raising a certain portion of those costs? We haven't set an exact amount that we would raise, but we do have the grant for 7,500 outstanding we're hoping to get, as well as we can certainly apply for other grants once we have the location, and um, as well as we are more than prepared to do fundraising to help cover the costs of this court. And we feel that with six courts, we could definitely get members on board to help pay for it, whether that's through the tournaments that we run and then pay the, the town with the proceeds or all those particulars could be worked out. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll turn to Councillor Rintoul. Yeah, thank you. I was prepared to make a motion, Mr. Mayor, so I'll stand by if there's further discussion. Actually, we'll, yeah, we'll finish our Q&A and um, seeing no further questions, uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Ms. Reed. Uh, Council will now thank turn you. to its deliberations and, and may have further questions of staff, but we thank you for your presentations and taking our questions this evening. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will turn to it as an agenda item and uh, to Councilor Rintoul. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll move receipt of the presentation and that council forward the SPBA proposal to expand pickleball facilities in Iroquois Park to staff for report and recommendation. Second. A second. Uh, discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, you know, I think there's probably um, a, a lot of insight uh, staff could add uh, to the sort of two scenarios. That are proposed before uh, council, and that uh, we probably need that insight uh, from staff and give them time to prepare uh, to provide their, their comments. Uh, and it's probably a timely discussion uh, to have at a future meeting in, in conjunction with potential budget implications as well. So I'd, I'd be happy to see this come back with uh, uh, some perspective from staff on, on the uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. Um, when staff come back with proposals, I, what I would be also looking for is not just in terms of looking at those two options for Iroquois Park, but presenting some other possible options. So we talked about uh, perhaps Breathour Park, but there's concern um, that Breathour Park being close to residential and because of the noise that that might be an issue. So maybe Rethar Park is where we put some more tennis courts, um, you know, to accommodate the tennis player community and then convert the ones at Iroquois. So I guess what I would be looking from staff is not just looking at options for Iroquois Park, but what other areas there are within the community that uh, 
where we could make this uh, work. Thank you. I'll turn to Mr. Humble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just in response to Councillor O'Keefe's uh, questions, I guess I guess the fundamental question is, you know, is is the request by Council to potentially go beyond what's already included in our Parks Master Plan. So in our Parks Master Plan, I, I, it's my understanding that we identify um, three three parks, uh, Rathdown, Brether, and Rest Haven as potential parks. Of course, there are other potential options, but they're outside of the scope of the Parks Master Plan. So uh, we could, uh, I guess we could uh, look beyond that, but uh, um, just, uh, just if I could uh, maybe just get a bit of direction from council in terms of what the expectation is in terms of uh, how far afield we go here. We'll turn to, to Councillor O'Keefe first and then turn to Councillor Duncan and myself. Um, I guess what I was thinking of was in terms of the parks master plan, I believe that we identified those parks specifically for pickleball um, is my recollection and I guess what I'm just looking for is whether we might consider um, those parks for tennis instead of pickleball. Just because I know Rathdown Park, that's my neighborhood, it's surrounded by houses. That wouldn't be a good spot for pickleball, but you know, maybe it would be okay for, for tennis, but I think they're putting a, a multi-sport, a, a sports court in there for basketball. Uh, same thing with Brether Park. So. You know, I don't, I'm not looking for staff to go above and beyond myself, what's in the, the, mar the parks master plan, just how could we adjust it perhaps to, to move tennis and pickle ball around within what's uh, the areas already identified. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor Duncan. Thank you. Um, I guess in answer to uh, Theo Humble, I, I, I'm not interested in kind of reviewing what was already in the parks master plans. Um, as Councillor O'Keefe mentioned, I, I remember Brathour Park being identified for pickleball courts, and I seem to remember that the cost that was in there was $150,000, um, which Ms. Reed brought up earlier as, as being, you know, the likely cost um, for, so that that kind of checks out. But, um, I, and, and Rathdown Park was, for a, a multi-sport court, yeah, with basketball as well. And I don't remember, I, I, I think, you know, tennis courts, additional tennis courts in Sydney didn't come up at all simply because it seems like we already have quite a lot of tennis courts. Um, and all of the other parks that were identified are pretty adjacent to the ones that are already there down at Rest Haven Park. So um, I, I don't feel it's something that's being identified as a need in Sydney to build more tennis courts and that pickleball was identified as a need. And, and even if we build, even if we converted a tennis court to a pickleball court, I still don't think we are underserved for tennis courts. And so I'm not really interested in going back to our parks master plan for the tune of $150,000 for something that's not identified as a new need in our town. Thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll, had my, myself next and then I'll turn to Councillor Garden to, and then uh, look for other, any other first time speakers before going back to uh, Councillor O'Keefe. So I, w I would concur with, uh, with Councillor Duncan's uh, remarks um, and um, indicate that uh, it's not a case that if we build, I don't think we should make an assumption that if, if we were to approve a pickleball courts in Iroquois Park that we have to, re have to replace them uh, in elsewhere in the community. Um, what I would be looking for uh, in terms of the staff uh, bringing this back is um, further to Ms. Reed indicating that uh, the Tennis Association is willing to sit down, that uh, I would like to hear more from the Tennis Association. Uh, I know they've expressed concerns. We've seen it in a letter of correspondence this evening that they have a concern that the Pickleball Association will seek to have pickleball lines painted on all tennis courts uh, on the peninsula. Uh, that's been part of the discussion between the two associations and I think um, I think we should uh, have a discussion or staff can have a discussion with uh, with those associations with regards to uh, to need or council can consider it directly from uh, from the tennis association I'll turn to uh, Councillor Garnett and then to Councillor O'Keefe. Thank you Mr. Mayor uh, just sort of to echo um, 
what Councillor O'Keefe had mentioned about, and, and I support uh, building courts for pickleball players in the community because I know it's a, a growing sport. However, I do recognize that there are a lot of tennis players in this in this community that are not a member of the organization that was referred to. Uh, having lived in that region and that area for 20 over 22 years, those courts are highly used by tennis players just for recreation. And I wouldn't want to pull that out of that community because that's walking distance for a lot of elderly people that still like to play tennis. So if we're saying some, there's another court within three kilometers, it may not be ease of travel to get there for them. So it is, it is something that's viable and used in the community quite a lot already. So I would be a little hesitant to want to have to, or to see those courts removed for that reason, uh, given that I think there's a lot more people to play tennis recreationally than, than we're aware of. So I just, we need to, be, to keep that in consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> so we have a motion on the floor. Any further uh, discussion? I see none. I'll call the question. All in favour? Opposed? None opposed? The motion carries. Thank you again. So we have no... Um, We'll turn to adoption of minutes. We have our regular council, uh, the meeting, the minutes from our regular council meeting of October 26th. I'll move adoption. Second. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, to call a question. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Uh, none opposed. Uh, the motion carries. Uh, I'll next turn to my mayor's report, and I have four items, uh, three of them uh, brief uh, this evening. Uh, the first is that on October 28th, that uh, CRD, uh, the CRD board approved uh, the 2021 uh, uh, provisional budget uh, for the CRD. Um, its process, as uh, council uh, may be aware and members of the public may be aware, is to uh, approve provisional budgets uh, by the end of October each year with final approval for budgets uh, occurring at the end of March. Uh, I would like to bring forward, uh, working with staff, uh, a summary of the uh, of the budget uh, submission that was presented to the board uh, at our next council meeting. Um, likewise, we at uh, the CRD uh, Hospitals Board, we approved uh, a capital budget, uh, a capital budget and a provisional budget uh, for 2021, and I would like to bring a summary of that for council uh, as well. Uh, the second item I have was on, um, on uh, October 30th, I attended a first meeting uh, that was brought together by uh, a consultant uh, called, um, uh, uh, excuse me here, uh, Wiser Projects. Uh, they're, they are uh, planning consultants, uh, and they had been in, in contact with uh, another organization um, called, um, sorry, I'm just looking for their, a clean, a clean Tech Community Gateway. They're also known as CTCG. And they have worked with uh, First Nations uh, here in the region and also on the mainland with regards to uh, housing, uh, both on uh, First Nation land and um, in, in the community. And um, this, uh, they were, uh, they contacted uh, the Wasonic Leadership Council. And the Wasonic Leadership Council supports in principle uh, a peninsula-wide uh, consideration of, of housing uh, quality affordable housing on the peninsula, whether it be on First Nation land or uh, within the municipalities. And so apart from uh, representatives from, from um, uh, First Nations, uh, Wiser Projects, um, and uh, Clean Tech uh, Community Gateway, myself, Mayor Orr, and um, uh, Central Sandwich was represented, uh, represented by CAO uh, Christine Cullum, who recently moved into that role, having been a senior manager with CRD in housing. Uh, uh, recently, and um, we also had John Riley, who is manager of CRD Housing, and uh, we uh, we got together at that time, or were, were brought together at that time, in part because of the um, federal provincial initiative for the uh, Rapid Housing Initiative, which is uh, later on our agenda, and uh, there is certain uh, uh, sense of urge there is urgency with regards to that uh, project, so we wanted to have a discussion that included First Nations, or the Wasanich First Nations uh, at that meeting. And um, uh, what we resolved to do is uh, that Wiser will be presenting to uh, the Wasanich Leadership Council 
um, as we will see in the, in the correspondence that we've received, uh, town has already replied with regards to available uh, lands uh, in, the, in our municipality. Uh, and so there will be further discussion uh, with, uh, with CRD on that. Uh, but uh, we look forward to continuing a dialogue in the future on the longer term uh, housing needs uh, for the Wasanich Nations uh, and our communities and, and having a, a, a broad municipal and, and four nation discussion uh, on that. Uh, the next item I'd like to uh, to touch on or to do is I'd actually like to me uh, read a media release that was issued at 2.30 this afternoon. Uh, Council received it. It was a, a media release. Uh, Ray, D Ray Creek Dam is, uh, is now ready for this year's salmon run. And uh, it's a vitally important uh, environmental project in our community. And um, while uh, the community may see it in, uh, in the media, uh, I think there's important information uh, in the press release that I'd like to, uh, to read out to, uh, to members of the public. And uh, it begins, on behalf of the Town of Sydney, I'd like to extend our sincere thanks to all those involved with bringing this project uh, to completion, including the Town of Sydney staff, who worked tirelessly through a number of unexpected issues. Uh, of course, with the contractors and consultants who carried out the work, specifically KWL, who was the design engineer for the town, and QM Environmental, who was the construction contractor. Also, a thank you to the Wissange Leadership Council for their guidance and support on this important project, which is located in their traditional territory. And to the Peninsula Stream Society, in particular Ian Bruce, and to the neighborhood residents of Ray Creek for their patience and cooperation throughout uh, the construction process. The project ran into unforeseen issues when installing the sheet metal for the dam due to a deep layer of clay on the bank. This caused a delay in the projects as plans needed to be adjusted. Then the project was hit with unseasonable heavy rainfalls which further delayed work and created a new set of issues with flooding in the work zone. In the end, the project came together through the hard work and ingenuity of the contractors and consultants working with town staff. And now the dam, along with the fish ladder, is in place for the upcoming salmon spawning season. <laughs> dam improvements were undertaken in conjunction with Transport Canada's remediation of the pond. Ray Creek Pond was classified as a, uh, classified as a Class I contaminated site, that is, a high priority for action site, in October of 2016 by Transport Canada, after sediment samples revealed high levels of heavy metals, including cadmium, zinc, chromium and lead. The contamination of the pond was linked to industrial activity at the airport as far back as 75 years ago when it was operated by Transport Canada. The town extends thanks to Transport Canada, Public Services and Procurement Canada and their consultants for completing the pond remediation project and for their cooperation with the town's concurrent dam renovation project. Upgrades to the dam meet current BC dam safety regulations including improved passage of storm flows with uh, withstanding earthquakes and improved overall stability of the structure. As well, it enhances and protects the environment, including fish passage around the dam structure. In the new near future, handrails and signage are to be installed to improve public safety in the area. In, in the winter spring of 2021, the town will undertake a public engagement process for park enhancements in our community. In the meantime, the public will have an opportunity to learn more about this project and the process of, the, of this uh, integral environmental project during the next uh, Mayor and Council's virtual town hall, which is scheduled for Wednesday, November 25th, beginning at 6 p.m. And details for the virtual town hall uh, are, are via Zoom are available on the town's website. And I just want to remark that apart from having that as a, as a key topic, and there will be some interesting photographs and some video of the before and after of, of the project, um, uh, the, uh, there will also be an opportunity for members of the public to ask general questions of, of Mayor and Council uh, at that virtual town hall. So thank you to staff and uh, for the work was, that was done on that project, bringing it to where it is to date and uh, working with many consultants uh, on that uh, initiative as well. The last I'd like to touch on is uh, our Remembrance Day ceremonies on, uh, on Wednesday the 11th. And as we know with the pandemic, we're won't be able to, uh, to attend an, uh, a ceremony in person this year, uh, which is, which is uh, really unfortunate. But um, Mary Winspear Centre is hosting 
a rem Remembrance Day ceremony in the uh, Bodine Hall. It is not open to the public and we ask that the public not attend uh, the ceremony. Um, and uh, it will be limited to, uh, to meet uh, uh, provincial health orders in terms of attendance at such, uh, at such, at such functions. However, the good news is that the, it will be live streamed uh, by the Mary Winspear Centre and, and please go to the Mary Winspear uh, site to be able to, uh, to uh, watch that ceremony uh, live. And uh, that concludes uh, my Mayor's report this evening. I'll open it up to, to Council if they have any questions on uh, any of the first three topics. Seeing none, I'll move on to Council reports and I'll turn to uh, Council Rintoul, our liaison to the uh, Peninsula Recreation Commission, Commission in their 2021 budget. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll speak briefly to this uh, PRC uh, budget report. Uh, it was circulated in advance uh, with the package. Important to note, uh, starting off the COVID impact uh, for 2020, and not surprisingly, uh, this saw a reduction in terms of uh, uh, you know, revenue at the, at the gate, so to speak. And so a uh, deficit was forecast uh, midway through uh, this year, which uh, anticipated approximately $400,000 uh, in deficit for the coming year. The uh, commission uh, looked to uh, address this by transferring funds from capital reserve uh, by and large to cover the lion's share of, of that uh, deficit. Ongoing debt as it relates to major projects at uh, Panorama include the pool, the arena floor, and the energy recovery project. I did present on the energy recovery project previously. It was anticipated in part to uh, be initiated in 2020, uh, moved into 2021. And I think one of the positive um, uh, outcomes is that there seem to be several grant opportunities that, uh, that Recreation uh, Commission staff have been looking at uh, for that project. So somewhat optimistic that looking out particularly into 2022, uh, when we may have taken on some of that debt load, that some of that could well be alleviated um, from future budgets uh, with some grant funding there. Um, and also, you note that the uh, pool debt retires in June of 2024, which will help with uh, cash flow. There's a summary of uh, 2021 uh, capital expenditures to the tune of some $900,000, as well as a summary of the equipment uh, replacements to the tune of some uh, $800,000 plus. Uh, dollars. Uh, which is the normal course of business in the recreation center. The uh, levy that is requested uh, this year from the CRD, and as I understand the process, this budget is approved by the commission, goes to the CRD board uh, for the next step of approval, uh, but it's an increase of approximately $180,000 or 3.6% over 2020. Uh, the requisition then by municipality breaks down, which would be an increase in the case of Sydney uh, uh, to the tune of $53,786, which is approximately uh, $6.68 per household, so under $7 per household is the intent with regard to that requisition. So I'll leave my report there, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions uh, for Councillor Rintoul? I'll turn to Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, it was, uh, it was great to see that the debt for the pool is being retired in such a short order, so that'll be, that'll be a great thing when that's done. Just, I don't know if you can answer specifically, but the 3.6% the increase of the 181,000, 371, is there something specific in there that's, that's causing that bump up? Do you know offhand? No, it was part of the five-year five year plan. And so I think the uncertainty with respect to, you know, COVID and how to anticipate uh, 2021 would unfold, uh, the, uh, the commission sided with, uh, with status quo with respect to planning towards uh, towards its uh, programs that had been identified in the five-year plan. So it's it's more to do, I think, with um, the uncertainty not enabling sort of a deep dive and forecasting what to anticipate and, and a status quo uh, sense with uh, approach to the budget. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, if I might just, uh, if I can give a, a kind of an additional response. It, it was, at, you know, discussed at the, at the meeting um, you know, attending also from council in that, um, you know, revenues are severely impacted uh, at the recreation center. And as uh, Councilor Rintoul indicated, uh, uh, the commission uh, chose to, uh, at staff's recommendation, chose to uh, not transfer over 400,000, I think $413,000. Uh, and that is simply to, uh, to cover the shortfall uh, in revenues. Um, 
And so when uh, the, only, the only option to not take the, uh, what was already in the budget as, as, a, as a requisition increase, uh, would be to uh, would be to significantly alter uh, capital projects, some which are coming out of reserves already, uh, and that wasn't uh, wasn't the de wasn't de decided was not the route to go at this uh, at this time. For me uh, personally, um, I'm hopeful that uh, the 1.7 million dollar energy recovery project, which has a grant application and, and Councillor Rintoul, you might help me. Uh, in excess of a million dollars, the grant application? Yeah, correct. My recollection is it was 65% of the, the yeah. project total. Is that if that comes through, that, that will certainly give some breathing space uh, to the budget, uh, possibly for the 2021 year and, uh, and beyond. Uh, sorry, I did see a hand, and I'm sorry I didn't note. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, the report. And this is a question I don't know if you can answer or maybe... Uh, Mr. Hissick could, but I'm wondering if um, what sort of costs they had to to deal with COVID. I know their revenues were down, um, but I'm wondering about their COVID specific costs. And I guess what I'm where I'm going with this is: is there any uh, capacity for for the rec for Panorama or Peninsula Rec or the local governments that support it? to use any of those funds that are coming from the safe restart grant to apply to any COVID related costs that Panorama might have incurred. So instead of increasing the amount we have to pay or dip into reserves, can we tap into that in any way? I'm wondering. I'll turn to staff if they can respond. And through the mayor, we're not privy to uh, the details about what the COVID impacts were on the Panorama budget. Uh, because we don't get regular reporting at that level from Panorama or the CRD. As for using the Safe Restart Grant, uh, I understand that CRD also got a grant under that program, and uh, first line of, line of defense, if you will, would be for them to allocate from their own funds before the funding partners would be asked to kick in. Okay, so I'm wondering if, if Mr. Uh, Councillor Rintoul could comment on, or the, the mayor in terms of, is that something um, that was considered with the uh, Recreation Commission? Um, if I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, no, I don't think the grant, this particular grant funding, which was you know just announced, and in terms of the amount the CRD received, was not entertained at the time of, of this budget meeting. Um, but as, as we know, um, you know, that scenario has, has changed. And, and as Mr. Hissick noted, there may be some funding there. I, I don't know um, that the Recreation Commission, uh, you know, wouldn't entertain that suggestion that we approach the, uh, um, the CRD with respect to some of that funding. But it, that, that matter has not come before the uh, Commission at this point. Okay, thank you. It'd just be nice for them to think about that, um, you know, if we don't have to dish out more money, if they have access to a pot of money that they can use, it would be nice to see them do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And just to, to confirm what uh, Councillor Rintoul noted, uh, that uh, the Panorama budget was uh, part of the, the wrap up, overall wrap up budgets that the CRD board approved, which would of course include the uh, Peninsula Water and Wastewater budgets that uh, Councillor Wainwright uh, spoke to uh, a previous council meeting. Next, I'll turn to, uh, so thank you, Councillor Rintoul. Next, I'll turn to Councillor Fallett uh, with regards to library services. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a short note, um, Council's aware that uh, with our recent 2021-2022 uh, strat plan, we set as a priority to review the options for the library services in, in the fourth quarter of 2022. And doing that, um, it would make sense to combine our efforts with North Saanich, who is, of course, our partner in the library service. So uh, with that in mind, um, I, I, I wonder if we could uh, take a look. And I've, I've got a motion that I'd like to bring forward that um, we asked North Saanich to work with us. So if uh, if I may, I would uh, read out the motion at this point. 
Yes, please, Ms. Mayor Council Fellow. Uh, that the mayor sent a letter to the District of North Saanich Mayor and Council requesting that they consider as part of their upcoming strategic plan review for 2021-2022 and so as to coincide, coincide with the Town of Sydney's 2021-2022 strat plan, a review of options for library services. Do we have a seconder? So, if I could get... Seconded by Councillor Wainwright. Uh, you wish to speak, uh, motivate further, Councillor Fell? So uh, just to, that if we're going to do this, that it would make sense to work together with our partner in this. And they've got their strategic plan coming up a little bit uh, later than we, we've just finished ours in September. Theirs is coming up at the beginning of next year. So the timing would be appropriate for us to give them a heads up and uh, to work together on this. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment? I'll call the question all in favor. None opposed, the motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Fellow. We'll turn to uh, committee reports and I'll fir uh, first turn to Councillor Fallett uh, with the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force um, minutes of October 1st. Thank you, I'll um, move re uh, that the minutes be received. Second. Uh, any discussion, anything you wish to uh, discuss, Councillor Fellett? Uh, no, just we, we've got a meeting coming up um, on Thursday and um, we've, uh, at this point, it was it's three weeks since the last meeting and uh, we've just given a bit more time frame in, in two things. Things have sort of settled um, into a bit more of a rhythm and um, so that will be, we'll be meeting on Thursday. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'll call a question all in favour. Uh, none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. We'll turn to Councillor Duncan, uh, one of our liaisons to the Beacon Wharf Select Committee on the minutes of the October 7th meeting. Will the minutes be received? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? None opposed, the motion carries. I'll turn back to uh, Councillor Rintoul regarding the uh, minutes of the October 23rd Economic Advisory Committee. Thank you, I'll move the minutes be received. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, there's uh, recommendations within here, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, with respect to the uh, first recommendation, the EAC recommends, and I so move, that the town consider as part of its budget deliberations an appropriate budget to work with a contractor to develop a long-term economic strategy in 2021. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, Councillor Rintoul, uh, then Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> Council will recollect that there was um, a referral from the uh, task force uh, with regard to uh, two particular items uh, that uh, Council deliberated on and then referred to the EAC. Uh, and, and both of those directly relate to the recommendations uh, this evening. Um, the minutes, I think, accurately reflect the uh, the, the depth of the conversation that went on uh, at the committee level. And um, I felt there was great, uh, great continuity in, in the discussion around um, both of these uh, subject areas, frankly. And um, I, I was, was really, really pleased with what was a very challenging uh, discussion put forward because I know council ourselves had had sort of a tough time with the uh, referrals from the task force uh, and I think the uh, EAC landed uh, in very practical uh, place in, in both instances that I'm, I'm happy to support. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you Councillor. i uh, turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I'm, in, I'm in favor of uh, this first one in terms of um, developing a economic strategy. I, I know that we, Council has kind of struggled with this and, um, and even as I read the EAC minutes, um, there seem to be differing views as well in terms of developing a long-term economic development strategy. And I think where we're getting kind of hung up is um, in reference to a long-term economic development strategy. And what I understand is that the concern is that due to the pandemic, things are uncertain. 
Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in January or whatever. And so there's, um, there's an inclination to just wait and see what happens. And there's some merit in that, and I understand that. Um, and even, you know, economic development experts, the advice that they're giving is now is not the time to develop and launch campaigns to attract new business or new types of industry. However, what they are saying is that we should be, there are things that we should be doing now to prepare ourselves and put the building blocks in place so that when the economy does recover, we can, um, we'll do so more quickly. So the BC Economic Development Association has said that communities that have a plan in place are able to start on the road to recover to recovery immediately and have a better chance of economic recovery. So what we're looking, what I would be looking at, I would expect is not that we're going to have um, necessarily a great big, uh, huge strategy that covers the next five years or whatever, but we're, what we should be doing is putting the building blocks in place in order to, so that we're ready to respond. So I, I think it's something that um, we should move forward with. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion? I'm uh, I'm in support of uh, of the motion. Uh, I think it's a um, a challenge that I'd like uh, Council to maybe consider, or perhaps input from staff, is that the motion reads an appropriate budget, and uh, the question arises is is how do we deem, or who deems what an appropriate budget is. Um, and then that begs the question of what uh, the scale of of uh, of a um, of a contractor to do that uh, becomes. If I recall, and I might turn to uh, to Councillor Antoul uh, to help my assist my memory, is that uh, when the motion went to to consideration to EAC, uh, it made reference to using a uh, BC government tool. I don't think it was. Uh, BC Economic Development Association. I think it was the provincial government itself. Um, and so I, I think we, sh as council, should give some direction to staff, uh, leaving rather than leaving it open-ended, uh, as to how uh, an amount will be determined uh, in the next uh, to bring forward in the next budget. First, turn to Councillor O'Keefe and or Councillor Antoul to answer, perhaps address uh, the point, and then Councillor O'Keefe. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, my recollection from the task force recommendation, you know, centered around the amount of money they had identified, and from memory, it was thirty thousand dollars. <throat> and that discussion was was quite challenging at the uh, at the EAC, um, in particular, in that uh, you know a group of volunteers uh, didn't feel that um, you know they should be uh, you know managing a budget of of that size uh, for an undertaking of of this nature. Um, and I know that doesn't address your question, but uh, they also, you know, chatted about from that same perspective <laughs> around whether or not, um, you know, this volunteer group should be doing this. Uh, the idea of, you know, following a template from the province or, or, or other organization um, should be tasked to a contractor as opposed to the committee. And so... Um, appropriate budget to me would would entail uh, staff using their experience expertise to reach out to try and get some idea of, of what contract costs could look like um, you know to to work on this undertaking I, I don't know that uh, the EAC had uh, any uh, input in their dialogue around what that that dollar value would look like thank you thank you uh, I'll turn to staff before going to Councillor O'Keefe thank you mr. mayor so yeah, I think what staff would probably do is we'd probably look to similar municipalities that have recently undertaken an economic development strategy, look at the scope of that, and then to try to determine a cost based on that. So we'll reach out to a number of municipalities. I know there's been at least two within the region that have done economic strategies uh, uh, within the last five years anyways. So we'd start there and then, and then look uh, beyond the region as well and see what we come up with and uh, come up with an appropriate figure based on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe? Uh, thank you. So a couple points I was going to make. So the tool that was has been tossed around, it's called the Investment Readiness Toolkit. 
And this was the, the toolkit I found when uh, last year at UBCM and talk, this was the provincial government that was working on it. And myself and uh, David Cavalli have sat through several meetings with the uh, developers of, of that tool. And they were hoping to launch it this fall, but then the election came. It's, it is a good tool, but as uh, Councillor Rintoul mentions, it's something that would take uh, a significant amount of effort. You need somebody to take the lead on that and facilitate it. Uh, the BCEDA also has a similar sort of toolkit. So what I, I think um, Mr. Humble's suggestion about checking with other local governments in terms of how to proceed is a good step. Um, I'd also mentioned before that SIP had offered some guidance to us on this. So um, they had provided Esquimalt with some assistance just in terms of helping them to uh, chart a process that would be appropriate for them. And uh, I don't think that cost any money. And um, so that might be uh, somebody we might want to tap into uh, as well. And then once, uh, and I believe they also, uh, SIP also provided guidance on what would be put into a statement of work um, if we were to go out for a contract on this. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any further discussion? I'll call the question, all in favor? Uh, none opposed, the motion carries, thank you. Councillor Rintoul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the second recommendation from the EAC and I so move that the town work in conjunction with the BIA and the chamber to facilitate a follow-up survey of businesses using the remaining $5,000 in the economic development fund and that the survey will be conducted during the first quarter of 2021. Second. Uh, Councillor Rintoul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and so this again uh, uh, was generated out of a recommendation from the, the task force around the, the prospect of uh, potentially the EAC um, you know, conducting a survey um, and in discussion it was felt that uh, because the town and Mr. Hagen may correct me if I'm wrong but through the uh, EOC had, uh, had uh, facilitated a survey previously that it would make the most sense given there was some funds uh, remaining uh, that perhaps uh, that could be utilized to facilitate uh, assistance from the BAA and or chamber uh, with those funds to facilitate a resurvey. So similar questions uh, that were asked last time to have that additional data in place, um, but also some new questions to try and gauge the path forward. Uh, a lot of the discussion was based on timing of a survey of this nature and of course, uh, knowing that we're moving into uh, what we certainly uh, anticipate and hope to be uh, a busy retail um, season uh, and a season, of course, for other uh, employers, other businesses, uh, where there may be some, uh, some holiday uh, time as well that perhaps we look to hold that uh, in the new year at some point and the first quarter was uh, suggested with uh, feedback from staff that that would be appropriate. So I'll leave my comments there, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rintoul, I'll turn to Councillor Garnett and Councillor O'Keefe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, and I, I noted in the, in the minutes that uh, Mr. Humble had concerns about survey fatigue, and I certainly had the same thought when I first saw that. So I was appreciative of the fact that it was moved to the first quarter, but I would even say towards the end of the first quarter, like maybe even the start of the second quarter, just to give that much a leeway and give these people a chance to just breathe more than anything else after everything that's gone on. So, thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm less in favor of, of, of this one and for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, so the issue of survey fatigue, um, but more importantly, now that we've decided, it seems that we're moving more towards uh, perhaps investing some money and hiring a consultant who is a specialist in economic development to guide us on this. Um, usually the one of the first things that that consultant would do would be to come up with some sort of survey uh, tap into uh, identify stakeholders and talk to them about their views on things so i guess my concern is that if we go and do a survey um, uh, then we hire a consultant and they come and do another one so that issue of sur survey fatigue is is an issue um, and I guess the other thing is that I'm not, I'm not sure that we're going to get anything new from this survey 
um, that we don't already know. We talked about this last time. And unless there's something that we think uh, there's information that we don't have that we need, I, I don't know what that is, um, and that we're ready to do something with it. Um, so I'm less inclined to, to support uh, doing another survey for those reasons. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. I'll turn to Councillor Rintoul and Councillor Fellett. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I may not have um, mentioned it or articulated it um, very well, but I, I am reminded uh, as I look at my notes, and again, uh, Ms. Verhagen, I may have to put you on the spot. Uh, I believe we had uh, committed through the um, EOC and the original survey that went out to resurvey uh, the business community uh, as a part of that um, initial process. And so uh, that came out <clears throat> certainly in discussion at the AC level. Uh, and that essentially, um, now that we're not operating in EOC, there was no uh, function to host that, um, that initiative. And so hence the suggestion here to work with uh, uh, the town, um, the SBIA and the chamber uh, in conjunction to facilitate this. And really the significance, and I know I touched on this, so I won't belabor it, around uh, looking at some of the same data, uh, some of the same questions, frankly, to see what's changed. And in answer to, to your uh, comment, and I, I think it is a good one, uh, if we're looking to hire someone to help uh, with the process of a long-term strategy, I would think that this data is going to be of value to that, uh, that individual in, in that process. Um, I have nothing uh, I can say uh, as a counterpoint to the survey fatigue because I think it's real. Uh, and I think a lot of people are, are hanging on day to day trying to get through um, these, these challenges. Uh, but there is an opportunity, I think, here for us uh, through this process to, to re-engage uh, with our business community and, and, uh, and meet that obligation that I believe was set out in the original uh, uh, survey that there would be a resurvey uh, uh, pending. I'll leave my comments there, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. I'll turn to Ms. Verhagen. Did you wish to comment on the intent of resurveying? Sure, through the mayor to Councillor Rintoul, yes, to confirm what you said, that was the intent of doing the second survey was to follow up on the first survey. At the time, we thought approximately six months later, obviously the time is flexible, and it was coordinated through the EOC the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fallett. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rintoul, for um, for your uh, report and also just to see the the level of conversation that came from the committee i think it uh, it, it was good to to read the variety of comments that came from them. it was obviously well discussed and well fleshed out uh to councillor o'keefe's points and i'm wondering whether if we, i certainly do remember the conversation at the task force uh, when Ms. Verhagen uh, was talking about the timeline for the follow-up survey. But I wonder, in light of hiring a consultant, we hold off long enough and for the hiring of the consultant and then to bring that survey in line if there is something the consultant feels that needs to be added to or amended and maybe the consultant is going to take a look and say you know absolutely let's go ahead with it i'm just wondering if we should if there's merit in holding off on doing the follow-up survey until we've um, consulted with our consultant thank you thank you councillor uh, Councillor Wainwright. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, the first motion that was made was that we consider hiring a consultant to develop uh, an economic strategy in 2021. The conversation is now starting to take for granted that we will be hiring that consultant because we're talking about let's not do the survey because we're going to hire a consultant and the consultant's going to do a survey. So um, we're kind of leaping ahead from we're going to consider this to it's a prerequisite for the, the second motion. And I, I think that's probably not appropriate. Um, I can see uh, some value in getting feedback from our business community of um, how they did uh, over the, um, 
the the December holiday season because uh, it's either doom and gloom or, uh, or or you know they they are on the road to recovery and getting that feedback early probably is going to have some bearing on the decisions we make about um, uh, commercial taxes. So I don't know. I, I'm, you know, for $5,000, I'm quite comfortable supporting it. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn back to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just to Councillor Wainwright's um, comment about the, the motion on the economic strategy. I, you know, the way that I read, I didn't see anything in there about considering the way that I read it. It says that the EAC recommend that the town allow an appropriate budget to work with a contractor to develop a long term economic strategy. So I, I didn't think we were. Cons I'm not with a with with a considering. Councillor, if I if I could uh, correct the record, uh, the recommendation okay. reads that ta the town consider as part of its budget deliberations an appropriate okay, budget. Okay, I missed that. Okay, thank you. Okay, no, that's that's great. Uh, sorry, further discussion. Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed. We have one opposed. Uh, sorry, two opposed. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. And sorry, Councillor Fallot and Councillor O'Keefe opposed. Um, okay, thank you for that discussion, Council. Uh, we'll turn to uh, Councillor Wainwright and the uh, OCP uh, Review Advisory Committee minutes of October 27th. I'll move that the minutes be received. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Not opposed, motion carries, thank you. We'll turn back to Councillor Rantoul, who is chair of the Committee of the Whole Meeting for November 2nd. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'll move that the uh, minutes of the Committee uh, of the Whole Meeting from Monday, November 2nd uh, be received. Second. All those in favor? Uh, motion opposed, not opposed, motion carries. Sorry, I see Councillor Fallot has stepped away for just a moment. Um, and you do have recommendations. Sorry, Councillor Rintoul. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And the first recommendation, uh, um, committee recommends and I so move that Council support in principle an annual seaweed festival in Sydney from May 13th through 21st, 2021. Second. Uh, Councillor Fallot, uh, did you hear the motion that was just read? Uh, it was the first recommendation from the Committee of the Whole. I appreciate you stepped aside for just a moment. Uh, sorry, if you wish to unmute, uh, Councillor Fallot. Sorry, yes, I did hear it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, no discussion. I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Second, uh, the committee recommends, and I so move, that the 2020 rates and multiples be used as a starting point for 2021 taxes. Second. All, all those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. And the third recommendation uh, from committee whole, and I so move, that the staff report dated October 27th, 2020, be received for information and bylaw number 222 be brought forward for council's consideration and that staff be directed to bring forward a 2021 budget item for a full-time junior arborist position. Second. Discussion, I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. I'm wondering um, whether we would be able to split those two things in half. I'm, a, I'm fine with the, the first one. Uh, um, Councillor, I, I a request, a request to split is, is granted. You, you merely need to request a split and, and it happens. Okay, yeah. so, so in terms of the, the first one, I'll, um, I'm in support of that. So will we just vote on that and then move to the second? Yeah, please consider the, the motion split and, and we're only voting on the, on the first part at this time. Okay, or it's thank you. On, it's only on the floor at this time. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, the motion carries, thank you. And we'll now turn to the second uh, motion, which is that staff be directed to bring forward a 2021 budget item for full-time junior arbors position. Uh, and so uh, that's on the floor as well. And uh, any discussion? Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, so thank you. So I have, um, 
Yes, some difficulty in, in moving forward with this for, for a few reasons. So at last community of the whole, sorry, did Councillor Wainwright? No, go ahead, Councillor. Oh, you okay. You have the floor. Um, so at last committee of the whole, there was a discussion about a budget increase from last year uh, for the parks department that was to create the Gardner Junior Arborist position. And um, the justification for that was uh, the urbis, urban forest strategy would create more work for our existing arborists. And so this person uh, as a half gardener, half arborist would provide that support. And so we approved that. And so in some recent emails, staff have uh, advised that they actually weren't able to follow through on that restructuring um, because it just took longer than uh, was expected. There was some absences of senior staff and upon further reflection, they decided that the Gardner Junior Arborist position wasn't the best route to go. And so now what we're being asked to, to put forward uh, for budget consideration is a full-time arborist at, I believe, a cost of over 70,000. So I have some difficulty supporting this going to budget discussions. Uh, I mean, coming from a public sector background myself, I'm accustomed to uh, having to go through a, quite a, a rigorous process when we're adding staff to the basic, uh, the overall operating budget. And um, I, it's at a time like this, when um, we have so many other other pressures, financial pressures and things, I'm, I'm concerned about adding to our tax burden. So this is not just a one-time expenditure. This is another 70,000 plus that would be added to our ongoing um, operations budget. So I have concerns about that. Um, I understand that there's additional workload from the urban forest strategy and from the new tree bylaw, but I haven't, for me, I haven't seen the business case to, to justify why another full-time arborist re is required. There's been some mention about um, the climate change coordinator was originally going to take some of the workload to support the urban forest strategy. And I recognize that staff haven't had the opportunity to consider that. I recognize that a climate change coordinator isn't going to be going out to plant and prune trees, but certainly uh, I believe the understanding was that they would provide some uh, consultative and administrative support. So I'd like to see a bit more uh, time put into that to see how we could mitigate the workload of our current arborists. Um, also, I guess, you know, there was mention of there's a lot of additional workload in the parks department. And for me, I'd like to know more about what, is, what does that look like? We're not a big community. We haven't uh, created a bunch more new parks. So I'd like to know a bit more about where is that workload coming from? And knowing that provides council with the opportunity to look at what level of service do we want to continue to give to the community? So are there, Maybe there's things that, that are, are being done that yes, they're taking up a lot of work, but in the scheme of things, does it warrant bringing in another full-time staff person? Um, so I guess, you know, before even considering this, what I'd like to see the parks department do is to, to uh, go ahead for the next year without a tax, without an increase in staff and, um, and see what uh, efficiencies that they can come up with, um, bring in the, the, uh, the climate change coordinator, uh, take a look at these other workload issues. And then um, if they still feel that there's significant adverse impacts to the community, if they can come back and tell me, if, if we don't have this position, this is what's gonna happen. Is it gonna be that people are gonna have to wait you know, an extra week to get service? Um, are there things that aren't going to be done? So I think there's still a lot more work to be done, um, I think, for me to feel comfortable justifying another full-time position. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor Wainwright and Councillor Rintoul. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, normally when an item gets referred to the budget deliberations, staff brings forward the proposal and the business case for it at budget time. And I can appreciate that we haven't seen the budget, the business case for it yet, because it's not budget time. The motion is to refer it to the budget. It's not to approve it now, but if it doesn't get referred to the budget, uh, we're actually denying it now. And um, that seems very inappropriate because we haven't actually had the the actual presentation of the rationale for the position and the cost in the context of the rest of the budget. So, I mean, I, I appreciate that my colleagues, like we may collectively decide we don't want to go there, but let's at least look at it and not refuse to even consider it. Um, I, I just, I, I cannot in any way support not bringing things forward to the budget to even look at. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor Rintoul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I concur with uh, Councillor Wainwright. <clears throat> this is uh, part of the process. And, um, you know, I'd hate to see us get into a position where uh, it's going to take us, uh, you know, several uh, years in, in attempts to uh, add a position um, when we think that uh, already the workload is is uh, is perhaps uh, challenging for one arborist. The business case is before us. It's the tree preservation bylaw. Uh, there's additional work in here. It was summarized at the last meeting, uh, but I anticipate we're going to hear more about that as part of the, uh, the budget process. So I'm certainly happy to uh, support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. I did see Councillor O'Keefe, but I want to go to first-time speakers first. Uh, Councillor Duncan, did you have a hand? I just uh, okay. Thank you. I'll turn to Councillor Garnett and myself, and then go to Councillor, back to Councillor O'Keefe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, not to beat a dead horse, but yeah, I, I was. There's a, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Both of you did. Um, it's it's to consider something coming forward, and I, I I I'm not comfortable with not at least hearing why, and not having within the concept of the entire budget plan before we're going to say we're not going to think this is worthy of being added to our work plan and, and budget so uh, the same thing goes for me I just think it's something that we need to to consider at the appropriate time and you know I think obviously staff feels it is something that's important so they'll come with a thorough discussion for us at the time of budget and we'll have a much better and thorough understanding of it all thank you thank you I, I concur with uh, with my colleagues who spoke recently um, and uh, the only point I wanted to address was, was um, with respect to the point that uh, there was the option of, of the part-time junior starbus position in the last year. Uh, a council gave, uh, gave approval to that. Uh, staff, as we know, did not recruit at that part-time position. Uh, but that doesn't mean the Parks Department was up to full complement uh, in the past year. It just speaks to, given the situation, whether it was COVID or otherwise, that that position was not filled. The case, and I did ask the question at Committee of the Whole uh, with regards to the addition of the of position in the and, and requested a description of some of the additional work with, which Ms. Clary provided, that, uh, that uh, the request now is coming forward because of changes to the bylaw. Again, th this evening isn't, uh, I, as, uh, as uh, Councillor Wainwright first pointed out, isn't the time to, to debate. I'm, I'm in support of it going forward, uh, support of it going forward to budget deliberations. I'll turn it back to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for that clarification because uh, it, it seemed that um, some members of council believed that the business case had been made and so therefore we were supporting this. But if the general understanding is that, um, that the, the parks department will make their business case in more detail at, uh, at budget time, then I'm happy to let this go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question all in favour. Uh, none opposed. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, the recommendations for Committee of the Whole. Thank you, Councillor Rintoul. And uh, we'll now turn to Councillor Wainwright in the Advisory Planning Commission meeting of November 3rd. I'll move that the minutes be received. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favour? None opposed. The motion carries. 
Uh, we'll now turn to staff reports. Uh, and the first is item 13A, which is the Shoal Centre Common Facilities Maintenance and Repair Agreement. We have a report from staff dated November 3rd. I'll move the recommendation that council approve the amended Shoal Centre Common Facilities Maintenance and Repair Agreement for a period of five years from January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2025. Second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, I just, I just wanted to highlight, I think this is a good opportunity. The Shoal Centre, as it's indicated in the staff report, was completed in 2004. Uh, and I remember that time. And um, it's, it's important, I think, for the, for the community to remember that uh, it was a unique project uh, that the, the town actually won a national award for uh, when it was created. And, and that was in uh, former Mayor Don Amos's term. And uh, Councillor Wainwright might have uh, might have been on that council as well. Yes, um, and uh, I think it's important that the community is reminded that uh, not only do we have a first class senior centre there uh, owned by the town and leased to Beacon Community Services, but we have assisted living units that are owned and operated by uh, Beacon Community Services. We have independent living units uh, owned by individual owners, and um, we have some commercial units, and uh, and we have a commercial kitchen. Uh, which is owned by the town, and that commercial, commercial kitchen is used by the different components of the of the strata. So it was very unique at the time, and I think it's serving the community extremely well. And I just wanted to highlight that it's uh, it's it brings the Shoal Center may, brings many different uh, attributes to uh, to our community. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, none opposed. The motion carries. Next move to the uh, library agreement uh, with the District of North Saanich, a report from staff dated November 4th. Move I'll the move the recommendation that council approves the amended library agreement with the District of North Saanich. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a question through to staff. I just, because I don't know and I'd like clarity if it's possible. Um, looking at the agreement we have and that we bear the cost of building and grout maintenance, just curious as to why the, the, there's a revenue split of 50-50 or why it wouldn't be slightly different. Through the chair, uh, our traditional cost sharing with North Saanich has always been 50-50 for the library. It's been over 30 years now. And um, while we do have an administration fee on some of our cost shared services. There has never been one for the library, but it is something we've tried to address with North Saanich and should this be extended further, we would be looking perhaps to add that administration fee. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Councillor and, and to staff. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all in favor? I'm not opposed, that motion carries. And we'll turn to the uh, COVID-19 safe uh, restart grant for local governments. And I might turn to, uh, to Mr. Hissick to just introduce it. It's, it's uh, a pretty big news for the community and uh, we appreciate your report, but for the benefit of, uh, of the public. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, following lobbying from UBCM and individual local governments, uh, the federal and provincial governments recently announced um, the Canada BC safe restart agreement which included uh, several funding streams, including 425 million, what that was earmarked for direct grants to local governments to assist with the financial impacts of COVID-19, as well as safe reopening and emergency response costs. We're pleased to announce that uh, we'll be receiving $2.758 million, which is much higher than we anticipated. This funding is meant to assist um, the town of Sydney and other local governments with the financial and operating impacts of COVID, uh, specifically items such as revenue shortfalls, uh, emergency planning and response costs, as well as some of the technical, um, the technology that we put in place to assist with both council meetings and working from home and those kind of initiatives. So as outlined in the report, uh, given the uncertainty about the short and long-term impacts of COVID-19, staff will be recommending a cautious and measured approach to the use of the grant funds. It's important in our mind not to commit too quickly to the use of the funds and initial suggestions for how to use the funds 
could be something as um, follows. First of all, make up for additional costs incurred and revenue lost in 2020. Uh, by doing so, we'd replenish our surplus, which would give us uh, much more flexibility going forward in the future. Second recommendation would be to take the same approach for 2021, which would potentially allow for continuing or enhanced tax reductions without immediate impact to residents. In addition, it might allow for some service level additions to achieve council strategic priorities. And I'm thinking of items like the Arborist and the Climate Action Coordinator, perhaps the Economic Development Strategy, all of those items which would otherwise have cost more money but are important for um, council's priorities. Uh, the third recommendation would be to keep a portion for 2022 in case recovery is slower than expected. And in keeping um, a portion for um, post-COVID, if you will, it would allow us to perhaps phase back to a normal taxation level should we decide to keep them lower for one additional year. So. Uh, an additional, uh, more detailed report on all of the above options will be brought forward to a future council meeting, expected to be the next one on November 23rd, at which time these ideas will be fleshed out, quantified, and council will have a chance to um, reflect further on them. Thank you, Mr. Hissick. Before uh, turning to the motion to receive, uh, I'll open it up to council if they have any questions for staff. Uh, uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. I, I like Mr. Hissick's ideas, especially of the one of using uh, some of that money for our potentially uh, economic development consultant. Um, I'm wondering whether we might also be able to use it, um, you know, for things such as moving ahead with part, parts of our parks uh, plan. So there was plans to put in the, the sports court and washrooms at Rathdown Park. Um, maybe fixing up some of our bike trails. And I guess I would see that as um, in terms of COVID impacts about having more outdoor recreational facilities uh, to encourage physical and mental health uh, during COVID. So I, I see that's where the fit. Um, also got the pickleball courts and tennis courts on my mind, if those are things that we could uh, tap into as well. So. Um, I guess not really a question, um, unless there's something to comment on, just a couple, a few more ideas, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, seeing no further questions, we do have a motion to receive. I'll move this report be received for information. Second. Any further discussion? Uh, Councillor Garney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to comment, I, I uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Hissick's comments, um, very much in line with what I was thinking when I first saw it. Uh, it's 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 the prudent approach to take um, to anticipate that this is going to be with us for a while and to and to make sure that we're not as much as we might like to jump to doing things here there and everywhere I mean I, there's lots of things I would love to accomplish too but I think it's the the wise thing to do is just to bits and pieces and keep it there where we need it in case something else comes up that's even more more uh, a, more of a priority in the future thank you thank you councillor I'll call the question all in favor and the motion carries. Thank you. We'll now turn to uh, 14 correspondence and the first is a, um, a letter from uh, Mr. Email from Mr. Uh, Curran, uh, Terry Curran dated October 24th uh, regarding lack of heating top up rebate for Sydney. We have a recommendation. Yeah, I'll move uh, referral to staff for report. Second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, sorry. Yes, I, I agree with the motion. I guess the um, only thing that I would add is I'm not sure if what's being proposed is that we provide uh, top-ups just for heat pumps um, or whether we would be looking uh, broader at any other types of things that would uh, would support energy conservation. If I could clarify, uh, Councillor, uh, the um, the letter speaks specifically and only to the heating uh, top up, and so our motion to refer to staff, unless Council were to give other direction, would be to 
uh, come back with regards to uh, to that. And I guess I'm wondering if staff could comment. Um, is this the only type of rebate specifically for heat pumps that are being provided by other municipalities or are there top ups for other things as well? I'll turn to staff and then to Councillor Wainwright and Councillor Duncan. I know, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I believe um, um, Mr. Newcomb is, uh, is available. He may have some comments regarding this. Mr. Newcomb, are you uh, available? There we go. Hello. Uh, yes, through the mayor to Councillor O'Keefe. Um, I'm only aware of the uh, heat pump top ups at this time, uh, but I've been uh, discussing uh, the availability of that program um, and what shape it might take with uh, CRD staff who are quite involved with this. So I will um, discuss with them a little further about whether or not there are other uh, programs that could be brought in uh, along with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb. Uh, Councillor Wainwright? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. There are a variety of other rebates that are available, and uh, municipalities vary quite a bit in terms of which ones they're offering and, and so on. Um, the thing that's particularly attractive about this particular type of rebate is that um, CRD is already doing a, a rebate program like this, and it's very easy to piggyback because um, all that the applicant has to do is demonstrate they were eligible for the CRD one, and that is all the paperwork that our staff would need um, to process a Sydney one as well. So if we go with a program that um, where we don't get to piggyback, um, we have a bit more administrative burden uh, for doing it. So I, I can, uh, you know, I, I expect staff will look around at what other municipalities are doing um, when they do this report. The, I think the, the main thing the letter writer is pointing out is that we kind of stand out on the peninsula as the only local government who's not doing this one. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> Councillor Duncan. Uh, yeah, I guess further to, to Councillor Wainwright's point, I brought this one up at the last uh, uh, report I did about the intermunicipal task force or climate intermunicipal climate task force, um, and this this is this letter is is referring to that exactly that program that the CRD was doing. It was in partnership with BC Hydro and Fortis was involved as well. So it was heat pumps and um, hot water heaters that you could get top ups for converting to lower um, carbon emission versions of them. However, the CRD top ups are now out. They've they've allocated all of them. So any top up that we would sign on to as a municipality and a number of municipalities still do have funding and they are still providing them. So the CRD may you may be able to apply um, through that same process if we join that. Um, but nobody is eligible for the CRD portion anymore, although Mr. Newcomb may have more information later about how they intend to proceed with that through the CRD because he is the staff liaison to, to that working group. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Uh, a question I have for uh, through to staff is that um, in a rebate program then, and, and hearing that the CRD in, in its uh, rebate has, has run out of funds, would it be a case that staff make a recommendation on a cert, if, if it, they were recommending that uh, that we do do a heat heating top up rebate that you would set aside amount for it and and it would the program uh, would last as long as those funds were in place or at such time that they ran out council would reconsider oh that's correct yeah there would be a, a specific budget amount and we would just go with the program until uh, they were exhausted and um, could bring it back to council following that um, I think we'd try to look at a similar sized municipality in the region and probably shoot for a, a you know, about what the number of uh, top ups that they've done in a, in a year and, um, and then just monitor it going forward. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb. And, and, I'll, and a subsequent question is, and while I clarified what my understanding was that we were only considering the um, the heating top up uh, rebate, but you indicated that uh, that in preparing this, if this does go back to staff for a report, that you would be looking at po other possible energy rebates that uh, that other municipalities are doing as well. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll bring forward a comprehensive look at uh, any rebates that are available and any partnerships that are possible as well. Um, I had understood that the CRD was going to be getting additional funding in 2021. Uh, so we'll look into that as well. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. And uh, any further discussion? I'll call a question. All in favor? Uh, none opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. And so now we'll turn to uh, our second uh, piece of correspondence, was, which was a letter from uh, uh, CAO of the CAO of the Capital Regional District, Mr. Lapham, uh, to our uh, Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Uh, Mr. Humble, and, uh, and the reply. And I felt, uh, given the significance of this um, uh, program that the federal and provincial government uh, have introduced, which was touched on earlier, uh, that it be received under correspondence to give council uh, an opportunity for any questions uh, and I might just start off by making a comment that um, I sit uh, on the CRD housing committee and last Wednesday uh, we had discussion and CRD uh, committee uh, recommended to the CRD board that uh, that staff be granted the authority to uh, to submit uh, uh, a proposal to uh, uh, by November 27th which is the deadline set uh, by the by the feds the federal government and um, so I'll open it up, and and it was just commented by um, uh, uh, by the general manager of the department that uh, to date, as as of that date, there were some 40 uh, pieces of uh, 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 pieces of land in the capital region submitted by uh, various municipalities, and the uh, short list that uh, is included in our response uh, would be added to that uh, added to that list. So I'll just open it up for questions uh, before we receive for information. And seeing none, I'll call the question. Or sorry, we have a motion to receive. move receipt for information. Second. All those in favor? A motion carries. Thank you. <clears throat> we have no new business. Uh, we'll turn to our uh, correspondence for information. Move receipt. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. We have no uh, notices of motion, but we do have a motion to go in camera. I'll move it is in the opinion of council that the public interest requires that persons other than members of council and officers be excluded from the meeting to consider a confidential matter relating to a land issue and personal information pursuant to section 90.1 A and E of the community charter and that council continue the meeting in closed session. Second. Thank you all. Uh, all those in favor? And the motion carries. Thank you. And a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you. We'll reconvene in five minutes. Uh, thank you, Council. Thank you, staff.